Hello everyone and welcome to Four Panel, your weekly guide to the weird and wild world of comics. I'm Andrew and as per usual I'm joined by my co-host Rob. Hello. And Mick. Hello. Who I can actually like physically point to now. That's fun. Yeah. So how are we all doing this week? Not too bad. I'm less coffee than I was last week when I wasn't here. Oh that's right, when you were basically not really human. Yes. I was very confused for a second there when you said you're less coffee. <laughs> yes, but that's because your brain works in a peculiar way that no one quite understands, including the finest neurosurgeons known to man. Speaking of not that. <laughs> <laughs> so this week we are going to be doing the thing that we were going to do last week, but then decided to move back to this week, which is talking about Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yes. The 2019-2020 uh, TV Min- sort of mini crossover. It's weird, isn't it, how they've done it this year? Usually they've done it just the ty- the episode titles have stayed within the realm of the individual shows. Yeah. But then they've had the episode title and then brackets one, two, three, four. But this year they've kind of done it as a like separate mini series, haven't they? Yeah, and like even because this is the um, the crossover between the CW Arrowverse show, so Arrow, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, Supergirl, and Batwoman. But it was always each episode has its own like Crisis on Infinite Earths title thing. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was like Supergirl presents Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, each one was a self-contained episode within theirs where the other characters came in. Yeah, yeah, it definitely yeah. It felt more like its own thing rather than just like an episode of that show. Yeah. Except for one of them in a way that I really liked an awful lot. But we'll get to that. <laughs> they seem like they've been gearing up for this for a long, long time. I mean, with all of those crossover things they were doing, and then they had, uh, what was it, uh, Crisis on Earth X. Yeah. Um, you could see they were gearing up for something big. Well, I, I, I think what it points to is that I, th- I think there are some financial problems at CW, and what they've done is they've um, they've taken all their universes and consolidated them into one convenient weekly universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it, it was quite expensive for them funding all that technology to visit alternate Earth to keep shooting the shows in. <laughs> but yeah, it. Uh, but it's it's drafted in some of the stuff that's not even on CW as well, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Which is so. Uh, I'll, I'll lay some groundwork first of all. Okay. So this is um, the story is about a guy called the Monitor, who I believe he's been in. He was in the Crisis on Earth X, was in E. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. And he's this kind of um, vaguely powerful guy from like who exists in the multiverse, and he's like, oh no, my opposite self, the Anti Monitor, wants to destroy all life replace it with an antimatter universe it's it's not that important really what the anti-monitor's plan is no so the monitor basically assembles um the greatest heroes of the multiverse who conveniently all star in cw shows yes <laughs> it's astounding isn't it although not all of them appear in cw shows as the superhero they're supposed to be no, yeah which i thought that was really cool when they did that yeah so so first of all they have to evacuate like um Supergirl's Earth, because that's one of the first ones to be hit by this big, like, antimatter wave that's coming. And uh, so they do was, that. Hers was Earth 38, wasn't it? I, I thought hers was Earth 90 something. But also, it, it's not that important, is it? It's, it's uh, gone now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they do that. Oliver Queen dies in the process. Oh, no, sad times. Yeah. Also, his, his daughter's there, who is a thing from Arrow. Yes. I ask Mick and Rob. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mia is from uh, Star City in 2040. Yes. And uh, has real daddy issues because she didn't know him. Yeah. <laughs> growing up. Her and her brother. Her and her brother both got sent away uh, and are pretty much left to fend for themselves when um, Oliver sent them away for their own protection. That old chestnut. And facility, uh, um, facility, Felicity uh, had to go into hiding because um, some very bad people were after her. I mean, basically it was just he decided, look, there's room for a salmon ladder or a crib and <laughs> we know which one I'm going with. <laughs> so yeah, he dies and then uh, the heroes have got to assemble the seven paragons of stuff. Truth. Truth. Justice. Yeah. The American way. 
No. no. Courage. Courage. And then hope, love, honesty. Hope. Destiny's one of them, right? Yeah. yeah. Basically, they've got to get seven heroes from the multiverse, which is basically a big old excuse for lots of multiverse cameos. Yep. And this, this is why Crisis on Infinite Earth was really cool. Because it's not just the CW shows. It's like every live action DC property that's ever been. Yeah. Even Batman 66. Yes. Yeah. Go- but Ward's put on some weight, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> he, he does not look like a healthy man. No, it, it's more... Uh, he needs to walk more dogs. <laughs> Robin the boy thunder. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. that's what it sounds like when he comes up. But yeah, so that was probably the first of the cameos, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was one of the first. I think we get a few right, like right at the start, like as oh, Earths are being wiped out. Uh, yeah, as as you do a few recaps, and there's a bit of setup. Yeah, like I think um, we actually we saw the Titans very briefly. Yeah. And by yeah. the Titans, I mean of course Jason Todd and Hawk, who might be conveniently the two cheapest actors on that show. <laughs> <laughs> we also saw the Huntress from Birds of Prey. Yeah. That, yeah. Like, that's where it starts getting really wild. With I mean, how niche is that? Yeah. The birds were praying from, like, was that, like, early 2000s? Yeah. yeah. There were five people went, ee, at that point. One of whom was you. <laughs> um, and personally, like, surprisingly, one of my favourites was uh, Tom Welling as the Smallville Superman. Yes. yes. Yeah. See, I, I loved uh, that whole uh, scene where they go to uh, recruit him. Yeah. 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 Later on. And, uh, and, the, and like Lex Luthor goes to kill, like the uh, the Lex Luthor from Supergirl goes yeah. to kill him and like sticks a bunch of kryptonite in his face. And then he just like grabs it out of Lex's hand and chucks it into a cornfield. Yeah, yeah. he's like, why does it work on you? Because it gave up. He's like, why? Why would you give up like <laughs> godlike powers? <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, that's like a surprisingly like, quite nice and touching send off for that series. Yeah. What I also liked was uh, the uh, Lois Lane's comment when she sees Tom Welling just wielding his axe. Yeah. He's like, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then looks at her Superman. <laughs> it's but, like but big also, buff Tom Welling. We get two Lois Lanes. Yes. Oh, yeah, Erica Durant's. And uh, who is the Lois Lane in Supergirl? Bitsy Tulloch, who you'll remember if you watched Grimm as being Juliet. I did not, and so do not. <laughs> but, but yeah, one of the things I wanted to bring up is her and, uh, is it Tyler Hot? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the Superman and Supergirl. I really like them. I think they're yeah, really yeah. good as Clark and Lois. Yeah. See, I like the, I like the chemistry between them. And while we're, while we're on the subject of um, Lois and Superman, let's not forget that those are the two characters who have actors on Double Bubble for the crossover mm. in that both Erica Durrance and Brandon Routh play yeah. dual roles. Yeah. Yeah, great. But- why else was Erica Durant? I don't remember her being. She's in Supergirl's mother now. Yeah. Oh, is she? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I did not peg that at all. <laughs> I think it's because everyone got confused by Brandon Routh being Atom and Superman Prime or well, Paragon yeah, Superman. The, the fact yeah. Is, yeah, I'm not sure. Is, is that super, is that supposed to be like the same Superman from Superman Returns? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wow. That series gets dark then, doesn't it? Yes. Because <laughs> I like that their whole solution for, well, we can't get any of the other actors from Superman Returns back, so yeah, they're all dead. <laughs> Although maybe that changes at the end, I'm not sure. We're doing spoilers, obviously. Oh, yeah. This is, this is definitely like a big spoilery thing where we're going to spoil all the things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the S on his chest is a different colour by the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like when they first recruit him, he's got the kind of, Black S and red. With the black background. Yeah. Black but, and red yeah. S, but at the end it's uh, gone back to its original colours. Yeah, so I assume that's meant to mean that like his earth gets returned and it's it's all hunky dory again. What I liked about that He's scene He's just a deadbeat dad again. Yeah. Well what I liked about that scene at the end as well, it was uh, mirroring the old you know, the old Christopher Reeve send off from yeah. the Superman movies where he just like like that and then just flies off to the yeah. side yeah. with a little faint smile. Which is great, because I feel like that's what Brandon Routh Superman deserves, because he's a really good Superman. Yeah. So, we also got Black Lightning involved. We did. Actually, yeah, that's probably, that's a good intro to what I think was probably like my favourite bit of Crisis on Infinite Earths. The bit where like Flash from the CW series and some of the others trying to go and I think it's, they have to stop the machine that's making the antimatter wave, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it turns out that like chained to that on a treadmill powering the machine is 
the John Wesley ship flash from the 90s. Yes, yeah. And it, like they then do the thing from the comics where the Flash sacrifices himself to stop the machine. But it's like, it's that Flash who does it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's like really neat because... Because that's been the foreshadowing all the way yeah. through, hasn't it? Because like, basically the CW version of Barry Allen is like the Wally West to that version of Barry Allen. Yeah. It's like uh, very much about carrying on that legacy. Here's a question. And I don't know if this was actually the case, but... Um, because it's just suddenly it's just suddenly popped into my head, and I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but um, the '90s Flash isn't that uh, Barry Allen's dad in the current yes. Flash? Yeah, yeah, he. That, yeah. That's, like, that's what the foreshadowing. But he also guest thought. appears yeah. as the Flash yeah. in a couple of episodes where he goes into the Speed Force or he travels back. Yeah, basically he he played Henry Allen, who is the Flash's dad, and also Jay Garrick, the other Flash, like the uh, the older Flash. With the with the kind of wing uh, yeah, yeah 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 I get you. So yeah. I remember a less square jawed Flash with a helmet on as well. Yeah, that was. Um... Oh yeah, you were thinking of season two when it was like Zoom. Professor yeah, Professor Zoom. 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 Yeah, that's yeah. the one yeah. I'm thinking of. It was impersonating Jay. Yeah. Ah right. Okay. Right. And then he was like the real Jay Garrick. Okay, that makes more sense now. But you mean it must have been pretty flattered that like. People were mistaking him for a guy half his age. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can draw a map if you like. No, because then it, we know what the map is going to end up looking like. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just lots of circles, isn't it? <laughs> lots of red string. You mentioned earlier about the anti monitors plot not really being that important. Yeah, and I think that's the only weak point for me on this crossover, is that the monitors plot isn't that great. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, it very much seems like this is just an excuse to set up all our heroes having these fun cameos. Yeah, <laughs> it's because the, the Monitor's just a research scientist who's yeah. experimenting with time travel and wants to go back to the birth of the universe. This causes the creation of the Antimotor in a An- way that's anti-motor? not... An- <laughs> Antimonitor. The Anti-Otter, yes. <laughs> not the Anti-Otter. Oh, there's a callback to four panel volume one. Oh my God. <laughs> Just like the flash, we've come full circle. <laughs> but yeah, the the anti uh, <laughs> the anti monitor's creation is not really explained, other than it happened as a result of this time travel experiment. Yeah, see, and especially it gets even weirder when like, so so basically the seven paragons we end up with are Supergirl, Batwoman, Flash. White Canary. Uh, oh, Ryan Choi, who is a new character who fans of DC will know as the guy who replaced Ray Palmer as the Atom. Mm. Uh, who am I forgetting? Because there's also Brandon Routh Superman, oh, Asterix. Black Lightning. No, he's, he's not one of the, like, the seven core people, is he? Uh, Supergirl, Batwoman, White Canary, Flash. Arrow. Arrow. No, because again, he's, he's not... Oh, no, the, he's, the not, he's seven, not actually one of the Paragons no. either. He's, he's just like a weird ghost no, who follows yeah. him about. He's not a Paragon. I thought Black Lightning was a Paragon. No, he's not, because he just appears in that bit where the other Flash dies, and then he gets wiped out as well. Oh, no, Andrew, you don't need to write down who the seven Paragons are. You'll remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I thought Arrow was the Paragon of Courage. Until the point where he died, and no, because the, the paragon of courage was Batwoman, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like she had the thing where she had to fight Kevin Conroy as like sad Batman who yeah. murdered the Superman, yeah, and now he's got a robot skeleton, and then he dies. And uh, Supergirl was the paragon of hope. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Brandon Routh definitely... Superman was supposed to be the paragon of destiny. Yeah, no, he was truth. Yeah, because White Canary was destiny. Destiny. Yeah, and there is Brandon Routh was truth. But then the idea is that Lex Luthor steals a bit of the Book of Destiny, which is like a magic book thing. I love yeah. the way they did that as well, yeah. where it's like he just crosses out Superman's name. Yeah, yeah, right, just just out. Needs a bit of a rewrite. <laughs> and I, just, I love the fact that like Superman explodes, Lex Luthor's standing in his place. Just a, I mean, right, that, what are we doing now? That is the most literal depiction of retcon ever. Yes. <laughs> anyway, there's seven of them. They've got to try and stop the anti monitor. So they go like 
to the monitor. Who first of all, how was the monitor there? Because wasn't the multiverse destroyed? But they can still like go back in time into it. Anyway, question: they, What about uh, what's his face um, from Prison Break? Was he one of them? No. Heatwave, no. He's, oh, was he he's just... just a successful romance author now. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. It's kind of, it's super cool. <laughs> Martian Manhunter, it's Martian Manhunter. He's the other one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was one of the paragons. <laughs> yeah, he's the secret eighth paragon, by the way. That's the, that's the ending. In my defense, he does spend a lot of his time just as a, as a bloke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Almost like it's quite expensive to have him go into full Martian makeup. <laughs> so yeah, so so they can, whatever, they go back in time, they stop the monitor from becoming the monitor. But then the anti-monitor still happens. Yeah. Because there's like a whole multiverse full of monitors and at least one of them will go back in time. Yeah. So they've only stopped one monitor. Yeah. So Which, potentially- I mean, I guess like, I can kind of understand the fact that if that's the beginning of time, that's where the whole multiverse springs from. Yeah. But also those... Yeah, I think my main thing is I don't understand how there can still be people who go back in time if the whole multiverse was destroyed. But... Well, I, I try not to think about it too hard and go, oh, I didn't know so-and-so was in it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's, 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 it's the hour of verse. So Oliver Queen becomes the spectre. They have a big fight in the quarry and the anti-monitor dies. Or does he? Nah, dun, dun, dun. Oh, yeah, also Lucifer shows up. Yeah. yeah. See, I love that. Yeah. Constantine and Lucifer just like... Amble in, yeah. amble out. It's just, like, just gonna... John Constantine, Johnny, 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 what can I do for you? <laughs> they very clearly hate each other and I enjoy yeah. that a lot. See, I, I would love for them to, to do like more just Lucifer and John Constantine. Who knows? Maybe there's a cameo for John Constantine in um, the next series of Luc- Lucifer. Possibly. Yeah, why the ne- not? The last series of Lucifer. Boo-hoo. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's ending. So the heroes pretty much save the multiverse. Like they, Well, no, they, they can't save it. It gets destroyed. So they build a new one. I was in- going to say, when you say pretty much, it doesn't mm. sound too hopeful. Well, it's, it's a bit like Endgame, isn't it? I would almost say it's a bit like the Crisis on Infinite Earths comic where the whole DC multiverse gets destroyed and then rebuilt in a way that's similar but significantly different to the old one. And that main difference being that kind of all the main shows and Black Lightning, they happen. That, that feels like, a, I mean, all the CW shows. Yeah, cause, and, yeah. But yeah I know what you mean because Black Lightning's not on CW, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That they all now take place on the same earth and it ends with them kind of mourning Oliver Queen and forming what I assume is the Justice League. It's not named, is it? But they do have a table with a star in the middle. Yeah. See, and then this they zoom the out and it's and it looks like the Hall of Justice. So I assume yeah. that's, see, that's the point. See, this is the thing. I think that the star, it could be the All Star Squadron. Yeah, that was a. Because that would also make sense because the All-Star Squadron is like a team made up of teams. Yes. Which is kind of what the CW is. Oh, also they fight the Anti-Monitor in like the new world and beat him up. Yeah. See, I liked the whole fight against the giant Anti-Monitor. <coughs> that was cool. Yeah, I liked that. That seemed yeah. very much like an actual comic book crossover where it's just, right, there's a big guy, let's all fire him and punch him until yeah. we beat him. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the other thing is that because now all those shows do exist in one prime Earth Prime universe, yeah, the crossovers are gonna feel. I think I think almost like they spent four years sort of building up. Right, we we need them all to team up so that they can save the world. Yeah. Now we need them all to turn up to save another world. Yeah. Now we need them all to turn up to save the universe. And now we need them all to turn up to save all the universes. Yeah. yeah. Now it can just be more like kind of an episode of Arrow where Flash shows up. Yeah. 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 Makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I, I liked the uh, I liked the little ending bits because um, uh, the Superman one, for example, where uh, Lois calls him and uh, he learns that he's going to have twins. Yeah. And that then sets it up for Superboy Prime, which it yeah. should be interesting. Ah, Superboy but Prime. but we have yeah. got we have got Superboy already. 
because he's yeah, but he he's is. not on pra- Earth Prime, is he? He is now. Is well, he? no, I don't know. No, That's no, because Titans, confusing, isn't yeah, it? Titans is I think Earth Eleven. Yeah, yeah, because Titans is Earth Eleven. Swamp Thing is Earth Nineteen. Yeah, and one of my favorite bits of that montage because they, they do a montage of like all the new universes. Yeah. Doom Patrol is Earth 21. And I love that the footage for Doom Patrol is just them dancing <laughs> in, <around>. a way, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, in a way that's completely at odds with anything yes. you've ever seen in the series. What I did like, though, in that mo- in that montage as well, was uh, they had uh, Stargirl on a different Earth. Yeah. But that's clearly the Justice Society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that they've... they've that, got, that's like, Earth 2, which very specifically was the Justice Society in the comics. Yeah, because yeah. they've got the original Green Lantern in there. Do they? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, I, I, was I, never actually, I never actually saw a Green Lantern, just the the Green Lantern. Yeah. Lantern, Lantern. No, no, no. There's no. also a separate Earth, which is the Green Lantern Earth, yeah. which I think is like specific. It's supposed to be the Green Lantern movie, but we're not going to mention that it's yes. actually the movie because no one wants to be reminded of that. <laughs> but uh, on uh, when they show you that, uh, that clip of uh, Stargirl with all the other characters, on the right is a guy with a green cape with like a... Uh, Orangey red uh, ah, right. top and uh, green bottoms. Ah, okay, uh, I, I was distracted because also in that group is Stripe, the giant mech guy. Yes, <laughs> and I, I was very excited by that. Yeah. And we'll have to see how that pans out when Star Girl starts later this month. Yeah, this no. month. No, later this yeah, season. I thought, I thought it was March. Well, maybe? it's confusing. There are different. There are different um, notes. Yeah, as to which when is, it is bloody annoying when you yeah. try and like plan a podcast. I know, right. It. I was going to mention one of my little favourite bits. First of all, I'm surprised, because I thought Brandon Routh was supposed to be leaving the Arrowverse, wasn't he? Well, maybe he is. So, so I was kind of, I was expecting him to, because especially because they brought in Ryan Choi, I was expecting, like, maybe he dies, like, maybe, because they beat the anti-monitor by, like, hitting him with a bomb that just shrinks him forever. <laughs> and they're like, maybe Ray was going to have to, like, deliver that manually and get caught in the blast or something. But no, he, he's fine. He's just, yeah. he's still about, which is nice. But my favourite bit was when Martian Manhunter's going around. Basically giving everyone who wasn't part of that group of seven their memories back. Yeah. And like Brandon Routh but it gets his memories back and remembers he's like an alternate Superman. Yeah. And then like just while he's talking to White while Martian Manhunter's talking to White Canary, just off to the side Brandon Routh is doing like the little hands on hips yes. staring <laughs> off into the distance. Oh, that was cool. It was. Uh, Brandon Routh's a lot of fun. He is. I like him a lot. I'm glad he's like getting more steady work. Obviously, the big cameo that everyone was talking about. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I completely skipped past like the big cameo in Shall episode we... four. You know the Arrowverse, don't you? Uh to a degree. Yeah. What the heck is a beepo? Oh yeah, that wasn't the Arrowverse. That was uh, Legends of Tomorrow, wasn't it? Which is in the Arrowverse. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. When you say Arrowverse, my immediate thought is Arrow. Yeah, it's uh, just Arrow itself. I mean, Beepo, it's a confusing distinction. The Beepo was basically, you know how um, in Japan you have uh, you have certain shows like Power Rangers, where uh, they each have like their own robots, and then those robots can combine yeah. into an ultimate form. Well, it was kind of like that in I think Legends of Tomorrow. Mick will be able to tell you more about it because Mick's watched Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah, I only okay. know kind of a roundabout thing, but Beepo was one of those things where uh, they used Beepo to defeat their enemy, which is why she says Beepo's off limits. <laughs> which I mean, because that, that, I, I love that bit where just they're all on the earth having done this like really big serious crossover. And then just this giant cuddly toy starts stomping through the city. See, and uh, everyone's like, what the heck is that? And White Canary, she's like, yeah, that's one of ours. Yeah. I just love the whole idea of it being Sargon the Sorcerer. Yes, he's making like Aslan. I, I, I just love how like Legend of Tomorrow is clearly like the weird stepchild of the Arrowverse family now. Yeah. It was a very Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man scene when people appears. It, it very much was. I, I imagine deliberately so. Mick will explain more about people. Mick? Yes. As, as our resident Arrowverse expert. Yes. What the heck is Beepo? <laughs> <laughs> See, as I understand, as I understood it, it was from Legends of Tomorrow. That's right, yeah. And yeah. it was kind of it. Was, it was a bit like you know the Megazord from Power Rangers. It, it, it was a. It, I think it is an actual sort of cuddly toy that stems from some kind of cartoon series. Yeah. And what happened was that um, when John Constantine first got involved with the Legends, uh, 
someone See, had unleashed unspeakable evils into the world, and Bebo had been <laughs> Bebo had been possessed by one of these demons, right? Right, and and was hiding in a Viking village <laughs> <laughs> and being worshipped as a god. It was I'm going to have se- to watch Legends of Tomorrow. Aren't it I? was in the season that started off with a murderous unicorn. <laughs> Fantasy creatures have been unleashed. That was it. Right. And Bebo was one of the possessed fantasy creatures. See, you're <laughs> right, Andrew. Legends of Tomorrow is the weird ginger stepchild of the it is, <laughs> yeah. it is. of the Arrowverse. I don't, and I just love them like kind of acknowledging that within the, the show. Uh, the thing is with um, with Legends of Tomorrow, all all the other ones, Arrowverse, um, Supergirl, Flash, etc. They all do relationship stuff as well, almost on an equal sort of footing with yeah. the superhero antics. Whereas with Legends of Tomorrow, yeah, there's relationship stuff in there, but... It's never important. It's, it's usually in the background of the crazy-ass yeah. adventure that they're having. Like when the heroine of the um, romantic novels that Mick Rory writes becomes real. <laughs> oh, Wow. <laughs> I, I definitely am going to have to watch this show. <laughs> and they have their own version of the Hulk. This this is not at all like season one of Legends of Tomorrow. <laughs> no, no season, season one of Legends of Tomorrow. Oh, yes, that was right. That was when the stories made some sort of sense. See, I, I think I prefer it now that they don't make sense. So Yeah, because uh, the ones that made sense sucked, and that's why I stopped watching yeah. it. Uh, so, yeah. so, yeah, the Vandal Savage stuff was quite weak. Um it got better when you had the Legion of Doom, which was Malcolm Merlin and Damien Dark, mm. and Nora Dark, Damien's daughter, that Ray fell in love with. Oh, Ray, you <laughs> silly Billy. And then it's just got progressively, simultaneously weirder and more fun. And, you know, the, like I say, the season four opener is Murderous Unicorn at Woodstock. What's not to like? <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> <laughs> follow that <laughs> I mean I, I guess I, I was going to follow up with what I thought was the craziest bit of, a, of um, Crisis on Infinite Earths but that kind of pales in comparison now <laughs> Yes, but just the fact that Flash meets the Flash as in Ezra Miller the Flash from yep. the yep. Justice League movie again probably the only member of the cast that they could afford yeah, you, you, you're not going to get Ben Affleck on a TV show, right? <laughs> exactly. But I mean, it, it's the, it's the cameo that everyone kind of focused on and uh, and talked about, and like, wow, they well, are actually I, I, bringing I, the Justice League movie into the Arrowverse. Yeah, well, well, this is it, and I think I think that was I think of all the cameos, that was probably the one with the most shock value. Hmm. Yeah, because like that's the one you didn't expect to yeah. happen. But I'm glad they did it. Yeah. You know, I'm glad they actually tied the uh, Justice League movie. Uh, into the Arrowverse because it, I think that was one of the biggest problems with the Justice League movie and with the Arrowverse in the beginning was that uh, unlike the Marvel stuff, they were two separate things. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Yeah, and I, I, I think... Um, so I guess that explains why those movies are now so totally completely different. Yeah. yeah. What I do all of reality got rewritten. Yeah. What I do like, though, is the fact that... Cause, uh, this has been pointed out a few times, but I love the fact that Ezra Miller in the Justice League movie is never once called the Flash. Yeah. And so, you know, when Barry Allen from the Arrowverse introduces himself as the Flash, Ezra Miller's like, the Flash? Hmm. <laughs> 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 and their but costumes as well are so protective, so breathable. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's excellent. And the thing is, the fun continues in the Arrowverse beyond Crisis on Infinite Earths, because there's fallout. When you combine yeah. multiple Earths into one, there are things that didn't happen running alongside things that did happen Yeah, in and the new Prime Universe. You're going to end up with all sorts of crinkly bits, you know, like the edge of nowhere. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I can, is that I, what Lex Luthor winning a Nobel Prize is, just a multiversal crinkly bit? Yes. yes. But you've also got things like Batwoman's got interesting because... Uh, the Alice that she thinks is her dead sister gone mad yeah. is still around. Yeah. 
but it's also a dead sister now. Yeah. That's going to be an awkward reunion, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> hey. That's really cool. So, of course, the challenge that we now throw down to the Arrowverse. Also, the, the other confusing bit about the Arrowverse now is that Oliver Queen is dead, but after Crisis on Infinite Earths, there are two more episodes of his own show. Yes. <laughs> those, are, those are going to be quite downbeat episodes, I assume. Well, don't those, those mainly focus on Mia now? Yeah, though? yeah. And I, th- I think that's the aim, is that Mia is the arrow of the future. Oh, oh yeah. that's the aim. Oh! oh. And it, I, I love the idea uh, of uh, the new Arrow episodes where it where it's because um, it sounds a bit like a pop group, it, Mia no, and yeah. the Canaries. But it was it was it was Arrow and the Canaries, wasn't <laughs> yes. it? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's um, it's interesting. It's an interesting universe we live in now. See, Arrowverse. Do you know what I would what I would be really interested in um, is uh, if they if they actually brought in the Spectre more as an actual entity in this universe now. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be Stephen Amell playing the role because uh, it could be another recipient of the Spectre yeah, Man. Exactly. Yeah, because they have established that it can just like pass from person to person. My yeah. my challenge for Greg Berlanti and his production team now is for next year's crossover to somehow integrate the Harley Quinn cartoon show. Oh, <laughs> which just gets better and better. And it, better. it is really good, I mean, especially if she's still a cartoon. Yeah, but they're not. <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest. After the Big Bang Theory and. Uh, Eight simple rules for dating my teenage daughter. I thought Kelly Kiwoko was basically that, you know, comedy actress for TV. She's basically over there. I didn't think that she'd basically, off the back of the Big Bang Theory, decide to become an actual geek icon, an actual yeah. established geek icon, well, it, by playing the role of Harley Quinn. I must admit, when, when it was first announced that it was um, Kelly that was playing... Um Harley Quinn in the cartoon. Yeah, I'll admit, that was kind of the main moment where I went, ah, okay, this probably isn't going to be good. Yeah, I, I was hoping, I, I, my preference would have been Melissa Rouse, who did such a great job in Batman versus yeah. Harley Quinn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, that's I'll weird be, that they've now both been Harley Quinn. I know. Yeah, but I'll be honest, it's a tough call between them. It is. Both well, are really good. We, yeah. we can talk more about this on a future episode when we we'll talk about it. Dedicated to Harley yeah. Quinn. By which point, I'll probably have watched the show. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be an interesting one. <laughs> anyway, uh, shall we take a break there and then come back with what we've been reading? Yes. Yeah, let's do that. Hey, this is Veronica Taylor. And I'm Ash Ketchum. Geek Show, I choose you! Hello. Do you like films? Well, wow, that that's good. We're over the first hurdle. If you like films and you also like podcasts, you should probably check out the Geek Show's only dedicated movie podcast, Cinema Eclectica. Well staffed with a trained array of helper monkeys, we review all of the latest films every week and do it reasonably well. And welcome back to the show. Now we are going to be talking about what we've been reading. Before we start, first of all, thanks again to Turnaround for providing us with all these lovely, lovely comics. So, uh, Mick, you said you were starting literally seconds ago and then I forgot. (laughs) I did, yes. So I'm kicking off with um, a collection of Doctor Who comic strips called Ground Zero. It's the volume that brings the collected comics from Doctor Who magazine up to date apart from the ongoing adventures that are currently running. And this one features five stories that form an arc, by which I mean a continual storyline rather than a wooden boat yeah. needed in the event of a flood. I mean, um, that, that would not be a very useful arc, I feel. <laughs> water is not known for its... Um, paper is not known for its water-resistant no. properties, is it? And, and then there's another one called Doctor Who and the Fangs of Time, which is a kind of autobiographical love letter to the show. We kick off uh, with a Fifth Doctor and Perry Brown story uh, called Curse of the Scarab, which has overtones of uh, Pyramids and Mars, the Tom Baker classic. And this kicks off the ball rolling. Um, 
it in itself is a hokum adventure where Egyptian relics have been brought back to be used in a Hollywood movie, only it turns out that the director isn't really wanting to make a movie. He's trying to unleash the power of the Greek gods. Uh, sorry, the Egyptian gods. I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the, some <laughs> the Egypt, yeah, yeah. The the It's got all the historical accuracy of an Indiana Jones movie. Um, sorry, he's trying to unleash the power of the Egyptian gods, Horus and uh, Sutek, etc. And the Doctor, this isn't really a spoiler for fans of Doctor Who, the Doctor thwarts his effort. I, for one, am shocked. I'm also even more shocked that I didn't take the opportunity of when the assembled heroes are going to save Supergirl's Earth of referring to them as Oliver and Company. <laughs> <laughs> We're not regretting that in any way, shape, or form. Most people don't want to be reminded of that ca- of that movie. So, um, <laughs> Curse of the Scarab is a great, um, great story for those who are fans of the series and... Uh, all the all the sort of key points from Pyramids of Mars are touched on, like uh, the uh, the mi- mixing of mythology and um, iconography with technology, and the fantastically realised back in the day mummy robot. I did the the mummies of Mars were like one of my favourite Doctor Who things. Yeah, uh, I mean it's, it is a classic story. I liked the whole idea of the mummy robots because remember we, that episode of Literary Loitering where we, where we were talking about Roger Bacon's robot head, where he basically... We've talked about so many weird things on Literary Loitering. Well, uh, Roger Bacon was basically uh, trying to take a human head, of a dead human that is, and actually turn it into like an automaton. So <laughs> trying to kind of breathe new life into it, put kind of automated life. Right. See, I shouldn't forget these things, because then I could just get creeped out by them all over again. <laughs> so, Curse of the Scarab is written by Alan Barnes, with art by Martin Gerrachty. And it's it's a nice, solid Fifth Doctor adventure with, with Perry in. Then we move a bit further back in Doctor Who's history to a William Hartnell adventure with his granddaughter, Susan. And it seems to be before the first episode. It's a time before they meet. Ian and Barbara and go off on the adventures that we all know and love today. So, William Hartnell and his granddaughter, Susan. Yes. Which means the Doctor was married and had kids. Not necessarily. So it's not his blood granddaughter. She's called Susan and she's his granddaughter is part of their Earth cover. They're trying to blend in. Ah, uh, yeah. Dotted throughout Doctor Who's history, there are references to him not having a family anymore or having had a family once. Yeah, I was going to, I feel like, mm. especially Russell T. Davis kind mm. of just went more with the, yeah, she's just his granddaughter. Yeah. Just... yeah. But it's almost more like the intimation is that granddaughter is just a convenient reference point for humans to understand the complicated nature of Gallifreyan uh, reproductive cycles. But I digress. Operation Proteus is set in. 60s London, and features a government experiment to try and breed super soldiers. Or is it... No. Is there shady, nefarious aliens at work? Hell yeah. See, that's, that's one of the great things about Doctor Who, isn't it? <laughs> that, like, secret government operation to make super soldiers is the not-dodgy explanation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the cover story. <laughs> that's the bit we tell you to make you calm. <laughs> So the story is by Gareth Roberts, and again the art is by Martin Garrity, and it it feels like a sixties Doctor Who story, but obviously it's told in a way that perhaps maybe the uh, budget of the time wouldn't have allowed. Yeah, there's not a bit where the Doctor like kind of bumps into a wall and the whole room wobbles. No, no, no. That that's let's explain the way as a dream sequence. Um, <laughs> now the next one, Target Practice has a, f- a panel on the front page that is designed to make any Doctor Who fan squeal with delight because it, it shows a story that contains a United Nations air base, so therefore it's unit. It's quite clearly the third Doctor. And there is a panel with a Dalek, an Auton, a Sea Devil, an Axon, and a Cyberman. And the Master. I mean, that's just... Doctor Who, third Doctor Gold, right there. Um, And also there's a sea devil there. Yeah. Gareth Roberts writes, 
And this is where it gets disappointing. I've never been a huge fan of Adrian Salmon's art in Doctor Who. It's a bit angular. And then, you know, the, the depiction of John Pertwee looks more like Wurzel Gummidge than it does the Doctor. He appears to have four very strong and well-defined hairs growing out of his nose yeah, for no apparent just reason. from over here, it looks like one of those weird, where they've, like, almost captured the likeness, but not quite, and that makes it look worse. Yeah. Like, it'd be better if it was, just, it was maybe a bit more stylized. And, and that's that's what gets me. There's a, he, he overuses shadow. So o- automatically, any any pretense that this member of Her Majesty's Armed Forces is in any way an ally is completely oh, shot. Oh, yes, I see. He's accidentally, he's put his hat on that was full of ink. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, oh, there's a Yeti. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, a Silurian. Oh, an Ogron. And it, it, it's a, a fairly standard third Doctor story with Unit. It turns out that none of those monsters are actually involved in it at all. And it's very difficult, because of Adrian Salmon's art, to tell whether it's Liz Shaw or Joe. It is, in fact, Joe. So then we go to Harry and Sarah on an adventure with the fourth Doctor called Black Destiny, written by Gary Russell, and again, art by Martin Geraghty. And this is a trip to Russia in 2086. And it's basically a post-nuclear accident story. And it's about a Russian oligarch trying to utilise the radiation from a a nuclear power plant that's gone into meltdown. Yep, yep. And then they escape and then the Doctor turns to camera and says, and this is what happens when you don't listen to Greta Thunberg. No, because this isn't a Jodie Whittaker episode. My mistake. (laughs) Sure, it's not just the art. (laughs) So, at the end of this, Sarah goes missing. Someone goes missing at the end of each of these, by the way. And then we get Ground Zero, which is the culmination of all this. And the Seventh Doctor takes Ace to a party world for a bit of R&R after their last gruelling adventure. Was it the one where the Master's like half cat? Because that one spooked me as a kid. <laughs> no, it's not, how he, it's not the Master being half cat. The person who's been orchestrating all these other bits and pieces with people going missing reveals himself to be an agent of the Flood. And they've been contracted to take the Doctor out of time and space. So everything that's gone before is some kind of trap, and they all meet up with Ace, and they all fight alongside each other. So it's it's almost a companion piece. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, and it, it ties everything up nicely, whilst also opening the path for some more adventures involving the Flood, potentially. Maybe you should have had that arc after all. Then. <laughs> it ends with the Doctor uh, setting off in his Sylvester McCoy form after reuniting Susan with her grandfather. And she recognises him as being her grandfather, but also not being her grandfather. It's a very... Mm. The, the centuries have obviously taken a toll on her grandfather. Um, so it's a, it's a nice little arc. It's it marred slightly by that Adrian Salmon artwork halfway through. And then the fangs of time are basically about the guy who's writing the comic strip dreaming of writing stories about the Doctor, but interacting with the Doctor throughout his life as he's doing all these ideas and scribbling things down. Okay. So it's, it's kind of quite meta. And then there's the usual sort of what I like to think of as DVD extras about the writing of the stories and the inspirations. It's it's a shame, actually. I do enjoy these um, collections of Doctor Who magazine comic strips. I haven't read a lot of them previously because the there was a time when I stopped getting the magazine because it was, like, getting ever more expensive and it was during the wilderness years when there wasn't a show. What exactly is in the Doctor Who magazine? Because whenever someone mentions the Doctor Who magazine... I'm thinking it's, you know, what's the Doctor wearing this season? And, you know, <laughs> here's some handy, helpful Time Lord recipes for you to try. See, it's not. I, don't, I feel like it's Mick not could Cosmo. answer. <laughs> but see, Mick could answer that, but also that does seem like the perfect segue into Rob's book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when it first started as a weekly comic, it was more along those lines. You had, you had news in the form of the Gallifrey Guardian, which was... Very rarely, actual news. Most of it was made up about the planet Beetlejuice. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so 
See, that's the kind of thing I'd prefer. But sticking with the fashion vibe, I'm going to move on to this tome that I have in front of me. That's a big tome. Yes. This is Paradise Kiss, and this is the 20th anniversary edition. And this is uh, by Aiyazawa. Paradise Kiss is, it's kind of legendary in uh, shoujo manga. This is one of the best shoujo manga to come out of Japan, full stop. Okay. And it's great that they've d- they've published this in the UK as the 20th anniversary edition because this is the entire story all in one. I was going to say, it looks like the manga equivalent of The Irishman. Well, it's not. This is the <laughs> thing. Um, see, the great thing about manga and comics is that you can basically, uh, because this was originally in volumes, you can basically read a few chapters of it and then put it down and come back to it. Paradise Kiss is... It's very fashion-centric, and this was written at a time when uh, Japanese fashion, when Japanese pop culture fashion especially, was really starting to find its feet, and that's reflected in this story. This is about a girl called Yukari, as she kind of goes on this journey. Um, She's drawn into the world of fashion by a group of youngsters who are heavily involved in fashion design and stuff like that. And it's about the trials and tribulations of becoming a fashion model and working in the fashion industry as a designer, that sort of thing. But at a time when your fashion doesn't fit with what the rest of the world kind of considers the norm. And so what you have in this, you have uh, characters who have like flowers painted over one eye. You have like multiple people with multiple piercings. You know, in that weird 90s phase when people didn't really have multiple piercings, um, you have kind of... I was very much that you thought you were going to say people with multiple eyes for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and multiple flowers painted yeah. on them. It goes into uh, aspects of relationships between the characters that I think some people might consider a lot more mature than is necessary in a story like this. But this isn't really aimed at a young teen audience. This is aimed at uh, more late teens who are... Starting to have that fashion conscious. They're starting to have Mm. that fashion consciousness, but they're also more aware of the ups and downs of relationships, things like that. The artwork is very stylistic because it's a shoujo manga, and at the time, shoujo manga editors wanted a specific style for the manga, uh, for the way it was drawn, for the way the characters were designed, things like that. And so you have uh, characters with big eyes and you have uh, very clean lines, things like that. But what I like about this is uh, that a lot of the weight of this isn't carried by, you know, really big action or anything like that. It's carried by the narrative. It's carried by the story and the characters themselves. You actually start relating and feeling for for the characters and you actually want to know how things progress. And I'll be honest, I'm a 44-year-old guy, right? There's no reason for me to actually like Paradise Kiss. Not one. I mean, look at me. I don't dress fashionably. I, uh, <laughs> I don't, you're looking kind of a bit of a natty scarf today. That's because I'm cold. Uh, <laughs> I don't dress fashionably. Like most people, I've been through the ringer with, uh, with relationships. I'm kind of jaded. And this is aimed at... That's because you work with us. That, no, that's not because I work with you guys. <laughs> um, it's the reason why I work so well with you guys. <laughs> I also appreciate you thinking of this as work. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the thing is, there's no reason for me to relate to this in any way. There's no reason for me to like this sort of story. And yet, I do relate to it, and I do like it. I like it a lot. I think Paradise Kiss is... It's an amazing story uh, that's very well told. It's got really interesting characters who are just finding their feet and uh, and making their way in the world. And it's the start of their journey that I find quite fascinating. If I had to put it into superhero terms, you know how the origin story of a superhero is always the most interesting part of their life? Mm-hmm. After that, it just becomes uh, becomes mediocre. Oh, look, bad guy, punch. Oh, look, bad guy, punch. I mean, you oh, say look, that. bad guy, punch. You say that, I could live without yet another Batman origin. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, I, to be honest, would wholeheartedly disagree, but yeah, go on. In general, I'd say the origin story of a superhero is more interesting than a lot I of mean, the stuff that comes after. Again, no, I, I, I would say, if anything, it's the least interesting bit of a superhero, but 
you're making a point. So anyway... Um, and also I can't feel my toes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Paradise Kiss is one of those stories where I think that if you have an interest in manga in general, if you want a good entry manga and you don't mind reading some shoujo manga, this is a great entry manga because it's about fashion and it's about relationships between people. It's very accessible to a Western audience. There's no world you have to immerse yourself exactly. in. Exactly. It's it's very much of the real world. And so it's totally accessible for a lot of people, especially now when everyone's a lot more fashion conscious. Except the three of us who are fashion sleepwalking most of the time. Exactly. I, I, I like my nice like sea captain's jumper that I'm wearing. <laughs> Keeps me warm. And exactly how far away from you are from the nearest sea going vessel? Actually, not I that mean, far, not, considering yeah, we're, we're in the away, river. Are we? Sea going vessel, I said. <laughs> Didn't they used to be? Uh... They used to be. Yes. <laughs> All right. I bet I could get the Gulf to go <laughs> underwater. <laughs> so anyway, Andrew. Yeah. So I have been continuing to read Stephen McCrane's Space Boy. We are up to a volume number five now, and I'm getting gradually entangled in wires. <laughs> <laughs> That's an odd side effect of reading a comic. Yeah, would you believe that's the entire subtitle of the book, <laughs> including all of this that I'm saying now? <laughs> so yeah, this uh, continues the story of Amy, who meets a mysterious boy called Oliver, who may or may not be entirely human, and is kind of getting more involved with him and trying to figure out what his life is. Because after, uh, after they had what seemed like a falling out last volume, in fact, being Oliver noticing weird, like, robot assassins eyeing Amy up because of something to do with him. Uh, she's now trying to investigate, like, what is his deal? Like, why is he just such a weirdo, Mick? It's me. That would be a twist. <laughs> I mean, th th the book does seem to be setting up either he's a robot or an alien or both, but that would be a heck of a twist. <laughs> I mean, there you go. We've still, we've still space, but I mean, I guess it works because, you know, Oliver does have white hair and mix you i mean you can <laughs> no, i use just for men to cover it up <laughs> but it doesn't really work well on the beard <laughs> so yeah and it's it's the usual mix of kind of this kind of more and more sort of sci-fi intrigue story with just some like high school relationship dramas i had those as well you see there you go the writing's on the wall but again i, I like that it's taken time to develop things. Because basically where we are with, like, <coughs> Amy and Oliver, it's a bit like the start of some, like, say, Twilight. You know, where it's like the weird, moody, aloof boy and the girl wants to find out about him. Yeah. yeah. But instead of the usual, this boy has been nothing but horrible to me. I must find out more about him. It's more like, oh, this guy who is my friend is acting strange. I'm concerned and we're going to investigate. Yeah, I mean, that was the bit of Twilight that never made sense to me. I was like, look, if this person is going to be horrible to you, then you basically just say, no, I'm not having any of this, and walk away. Yeah. Is, is it because he slightly purses his lips and he goes, hmm, like that all the time? And he literally sparkles in the sunshine. <laughs> yes. No, no, God damn it, it's 2020. We can't make fun of Twilight anymore. It's been done. It's such a rich vein of material, it though, is, isn't it? though, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I only watched 20 minutes and I could rip the mick out of those 20 minutes for, oh, hours. Yeah. It's it's like when you're some kind of South African baron and you've just got a mine full of diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's technically wrong to keep just scooping out handfuls of them, but there's so much there. <laughs> the thing that I, I always found funny was um, someone pointed this out to me. He said, uh, if you watch Twilight, um, every scene that Robin pa Robert Pattinson meets, um, what's her face? Kristen Stewart. Yeah. Every scene that uh, they kind of look at each other, it's as if he's trying to pull off the Derek Zoolander Magnum <laughs> look on his face because his lips are always slightly pursed as if he's trying to do Magnum but failing. Yeah, you, you would have to watch Zoolander to get that reference. Just Zoolander though, not Zoolander 2. As I have no intention of watching Zoolander in the foreseeable future, it's unlikely I'll get round to the sequel. Trust me, like many movies, it could sneak up on you. You could be channel hopping and then, you know, just right in front of you, Zoolander. Anyway, Space Boy, 
I like it. It's you know, it's it's a fun mix of intrigue and like relationship dramas. It's also got some good funny bits. Like there's a there's a bit where they all like do fancy dress for school and everyone has a fake mustache. See, Andrew loves his fake mustache. I do love a good fake mustache. And you just remind me of that Futurama episode where Calculon gets resurrected and his disguise is a fake mustache. And it's also, I think something I wanted to bring up is weirdly comparing it to like The Legend of Korra. Yeah. Because these are both books that come out like, what, every two months, something like that. Yeah. But this like, this feels like a much more substantial chapter in a story. Well, I mean, just looking at the uh, actual uh, thickness of the volume, there's a lot more pages in that than there were in that Legend of Korra. Yeah, and I think just not even... Well, obviously the page count helps because you can, you can do more stuff when you have more pages. Yes. That's, that's a little comic writing advice uh, for you. Is it? Wow. Take it from an old pro in this biz. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, but I think it's, it seems like a better understanding of if the characters start here and they're here by the end of it, it feels more like not only have you got a good chunk of the story, but you've, like, it's, it's enough to feel satisfying, but not so much that by the time you pick up the next one, you're completely lost. Right. Okay, I'll make a note of that. More pages equals bigger chunk. Right. There we go. Shall, shall we move past my big meaty chunks to you again? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, a few weeks ago, I um, a book called Calamity Kate, which I just couldn't get on with. I didn't finish it. It it was painfully derivative and played on ideas that had been done before better, and yeah. it kind of mashed them together. Um, it was written by Max Visaggio. It's oddly not listed in the credits of this book. <laughs> oh, clearly they heard your review. <laughs> Um, but um, this is Strangeland from he- uh, Humanoid's Ignition universe. Um, and this has parallels with other stuff. So th- the Ignition universe is a universe in which the world, something has happened in the world, and this has generated a lot of superpowered individuals who didn't have superpowers before. It's a little bit like. Uh, in humans with terogenesis mists, or oh, that's that's some pedigree you're giving it. But you know, you can see where the parallels come from. The the children of the atom references. Yeah, but, for there's X-Men been some like kind that. of thing that's yeah. been released into the environment, and it's so, given people superpowers. An event has given people powers. So yeah, um, and this one follows the adventures of Adam and Ilachi Land, who are not related. They're not married. They just happen to share the same name. They have got superpowers. They don't have a relationship other than the one that their superpowers force them to have. If they touch, their powers become catastrophic. If they're too far apart, the same. That seems rather (laughs) inconvenient. Okay. So they both have like little Fitbit style devices that measure how far they are from the other one. And they're being hunted. And uh, they have a benefactor called uh, Kitty Hawk who keeps sending them not on missions so much, but just trying to find answers. And she funds any investigation that they have to do. So in this particular bit, they go to Colorado to this um, kind of almost like a sort of commune where this guy is preaching this therapy that helps people to get rid of their powers if they don't want them. And obviously... As you mentioned, this one is particularly inconvenient. Yeah. I mean, imagine if they didn't like each other, right? Oh, by the way, sometimes they don't. I mean, if I guess they've ever, like, got two, I hate you, just give them a little bonk in the nose and boom, it's all over. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is like, um, we, we were covering the Arrowverse earlier. Remember when the two halves of Firestorm were always on at each other? Yeah. It, it's that kind of a thing. But they're being hunted by British intelligence for some reason, um, which hopefully will become clear in Volume 2. Britain has intelligence? Yes. Yeah, and apparently they sent it all to America, so that explains a lot. It's it's the Simon Cowell show that didn't take off. (laughs) So this is Strange Lands, Volume 1, Love and Chaos. It's got an interesting uh, creative team behind it. So there's Madeline 
Visaggio, that I mentioned earlier. And then she's assisted by a lip and Apache geoscientist and writer called Darcy Little Badger, which has got to be <laughs> the best name in comics <laughs> yeah. this week. I mean, yeah, it's yeah up, it's this week, that. definitely. <laughs> it's up there with Wade Von Grow Badger, definitely. Yeah. So and the art, about them badgers. The art is by the Spanish artist Guillermo Sanna. Sanna and it's, it's nice. It works. Riffs on some fairly common superhero tropes. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it's hard not to, isn't it? Yeah. Unlike Calamity Kate, it does it in a, a new and original way, and there are some interesting twists on the characters. There's enough mystery to keep you hooked for other bits and pieces. And actually, enough so that um, I'd quite like to explore more of the Ignition universe. This, is also, uh, this has, coming from H1 Ignition... Uh, there's ignited an omni, and if there anything, if this is anything to go by, it's a universe that I won't mind spending a bit more time in. Maybe not ignited though, as as, yeah. as I mentioned on a previous episode. All right, Cause that's the one that's a bit yeah, crikey. <laughs> I'll bring ignited. You can have a read of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it might set more of a scene for the background to this. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, I guess if you get like a bit of shape of the world. Yeah. Right. So uh, I have. For my last one, this is also a H1 original, um, not H1 Ignition, though. Ah. And this is The Big Country, and this has some plaudits from people like uh, Brian K. Vaughan, but uh, this is written by someone who was a contender for Best Name in Comics this week. Until Darcy Un- Little Badger yeah, turned up. Basically, just laid the smack down. This was written by Quinton Peoples. <laughs> that is a good one as well. <laughs> it's a good one. With uh, art and colours by uh, Dennis Calero and uh, letters by And World Design. And World. And World. Yes. And so um, this is basically, it's set in Texas and it's this weird time uh, when it's kind of, it doesn't really date it to any particular time period, but you get the idea that it's kind of late 80s, early 90s, that sort of thing. And it's about a small town in Texas where you have a sheriff and uh, something bad happens in this small town. The very first scene... Cue sirens. <laughs> exactly. The very first scene is of a guy sitting in his pickup truck outside the house and he walks into the house and his daughter's there watching TV and he there's this naked guy in the kitchen having a drink, and he shoots the naked guy, then shoots the woman. You know, there's no real actual speech then. It's just kind of someone's reminiscing about how it all began. And you get the idea that uh, it's the guy's house, and that's his wife having an affair with somebody. And you think, okay, this is straightforward. A guy is on the run from the sheriff because he basically killed his wife and her lover. But actually, the story's a lot darker and a lot more complicated. Than, it's a lot darker than someone killing someone. Yeah, a lot okay. darker than that. Okay. This go, This starts uh, hinting at places where uh, really it can be uncomfortable reading when it, when it starts hinting at some, some of the actual real darkness. Because for a while you think, okay, it's just a straight-up crime of passion. But then... As matters progress, you start thinking, hang on, this is more like a revenge killing. But then, by the end of it, you're like, okay, I don't really like the way this story's developed. Not because it's not well written, not because it doesn't have interesting characters, but because it's the kind of story that you would read in a newspaper and say, just how evil are people. The kind of story that ends up as a Netflix documentary. Yeah. This is one of those type stories. In terms of the artwork, in terms of the actual characters, in terms of the way the uh, story is put together, it's solid. I can't, you know, there's very little to fault it. But in terms of how it actually made me feel, I really didn't like that. Because when I read a comic, I, there's there's sometimes when a comic can be too real. You know, you yeah, read it's comics. Just, it's good. It's just one of those things that you can't really recommend. I can't really recommend it to anyone, even though uh, even though it's got things to a lot of things to recommend it. I can't really recommend it if you're just a casual comic comic book reader, 
if you're into your superhero comics and things like that, this is one of those stories where it would literally just make you stop and go, I, I don't want to read any more of this. So, bi- yeah, should, should, should we move on to something yeah, a bit lighter then? Th- that's what I was about to say. Um, the Big Country, difficult to recommend to anyone. Okay, so what? Even I- though it's got good things. So what I've been reading is Eminon Volume 3, uh, Eminon Wanderer Part 2 by Shinji Kaijo and Kenji Saruta. Nailed it. And uh, this is the story of Eminon in 1973. And it's it's a pretty light story, to be honest. I mean, light in the sense that it's not, not, not like cheery and happy. I, yeah. like, I guess it's, it's not depressing or anything. So basically, Eminon, she's wandering through a forest. She gets caught in a pretty bad rainstorm, ends up developing what looks like pneumonia and collapsing, where she's found by a guy who takes her to a hospital and she wakes up. And she doesn't remember anything at all. Not a single moment of her three billion years worth of history. Wow. Yeah, and so she ends up just kind of living a perfectly ordinary life in a small town with this guy. And it's like... That must seem like heaven. Yeah, yeah, I think that is the point. That it's like, it's basically, what if you did just get to settle down and just live a normal life? Because she's not unhappy, but it's more like just the satisfaction of being able to be an actual person rather than just yeah wandering about from place to place rather than being an entity an existence yeah exactly but i feel like the thing for me is this is a story with nine chapters yeah and it does not need to be a story with nine chapters because i feel like even on a four or five yeah you could tell a pretty concise story and it's, i love the art it's really great but there's only so many Shots of Eminon staring wistfully out at like a reservoir that I can take before I think, <laughs> okay, we could maybe just not have this bit. Is it the manga equivalent of the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> of the yeah. other one, the Rod of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, basically, if you replace Eminon has a smoke break with Hobbits sing some songs, <laughs> it's Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Frodo stares at the, <laughs> the crack of doom in yeah. the distance. <laughs> Sam apologizes and pulls his pants off. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that, that <laughs> there's some genuinely striking bits of our heart. There's Eminon, uh, basically in her dreams of her memories almost come back. So like she'll have things where she's like floating in an ocean, like completely there's nothing about. And then like a giant prehistoric fish comes to try and eat her. Or she's like running through a forest chased by like, the skeleton of a T-Rex. Yeah. And that's really cool. But it's just... It's again, I feel like it could be shorter, especially because it skips kind of a lot of the last stuff, which I think is the most interesting part of the story, which is, because I'm probably just have to spoil the whole thing. So eventually, like I said, she settles down with this guy, they get married, and then she has a kid. But yeah. as we know, when Eminon, you know, gives birth, it's to basically herself, and that new version gets all the memories, leaving mother just an empty husk so it's, you think it's going to be a sad ending but then it skips to uh sort of the prologue for eminon wanderer 1980 where it's actually so rob i assume you remember the first yeah. the original story about a guy who meets eminon yeah. on a boat and then years later at the train station yeah he meets like her kind of masquerading as her own daughter yeah and that's that version of eminon is it? Yeah. It's the idea that actually her husband, Ryozu, he stuck around and like helped nurse basically like what she refers to as the carrier back to health. And she like actually got her own personality. And like, this is the story of kind of the version of Eminon that stuck around and actually got raised as a child. Cool. And like, that's, that's the story I'm interested. I'm really excited for the next volume of this. Yeah. <laughs> but she's just also thinking... Boy, I wish we could have had more stuff of that <laughs> instead of Emma and I'm just kind of looking at a beach. And it's a very nice looking beach. So this is basically a green leaf salad before the steak arrives. Yes, that, that works because there's a lot of foliage in here as well. <laughs> well, we'll see how things progress. But and, still a recommendation, would you say? Yeah, that's still say a recommendation. It's just maybe, 
Well, yeah, I, I guess because you, you want to stick with Eminon as a series. Yeah, yeah. Even if this is one of the slightly weaker bits. Well, it's like it's like anything. There's going to be weak moments in the series, but you stick with it for the actual series, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And the next bit seems like it's going to be a really good bit. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. And I, I think, is that us finally done? That's us done. So you can catch uh, all of our episodes of 4Panel on our website and uh, whichever podcast provider that you uh, have decided that you want to use on your phone or your laptop or whatever device you're using to listen to us on. Words to that effect. Indeed. Um, oh, oh, also, actually, uh, before I forget, if you want to hear more of me, I'll be doing a guest appearance on the Play Comics podcast where I talk about a Judge Dredd video game. It's real bad, but it also has full motion video cutscenes, which are amazing. Yes, there is one, Mick. Don't worry. We'll tell you about it uh, after we finish recording. Anyway, I mean, to be fair, there's quite a few. Yeah. So anyway, on our website, you'll also find all sorts of other stuff, YouTube videos and uh, various other shows that we do on our network. Until next time, I've been Rob. I've been Andrew. And I've been Mick. And we will see you all later. Thanks for listening. Goodbye now.